Hey everyone, welcome back to Make It Happen. My name is Dr. Brent Siebold. I'm here to uh, share with you a little tip uh, and a few tricks around this really important concept uh, pertaining to your role as an innovator in your, in your current situation at work or school or within your community. Um, it's really about creating value. How do we create value? And then the bigger question is if we're creating something that's worthwhile, how do we sustain that effort? How do, we, how do we scale that effort? Because if we're creating something powerful for ourselves, and if we're creating something powerful that a few other people really value, then the next question is, where, where, where do we stop? And hopefully, if, you, if you're affiliated with Arizona State University, the answer is you don't stop. We think big here at ASU. We are the world's largest public university. I think that's true. I might need to check the stats, but we are big. We think big. We think globally. So the challenge for all of you in the audience is if I create something useful, if I create something that's worthwhile to a hand, handful of folks, how do I bring it to more folks who can benefit from my invention, from my technology, from my service, from my uh, way of doing things that's different and better than the status quo? So uh, again, welcome to everybody to Make It Happen. This is a weekly session that we host. We normally have a, a, a whole slate of, of amazing guests, but today I'm filling in for a guest who couldn't make it, uh, so you're stuck with me. Let's do it. Okay, so in order to start with understanding how to uh, scale and sustain the, your, your value, let's, let's start with a, another term that is thrown around quite liberally at Arizona State University, mainly because we're number one in it. Uh, what does that mean? Innovation. So there's a wide uh, array of innovation definitions, um, you know, in all the usual places you might look, uh, the dictionary, Wikipedia, uh, uh, books on the, t on the subject of innovation. So this is not an official definition. This is my definition that I, I crafted together um, in order to teach this stuff effectively in the classroom at Arizona State University. So what I'd like to do is deconstruct this definition to provide some argument as to why uh, this is important to all of us. And, and hopefully as I do this, you can uh, kind of apply this to your own uh, line of thinking as an innovator in your respective realms of, of influence, whether that be robotics, whether that be art, whether that be music, whether that be design, whatever you're into, my argument is this innovation methodology applies. So pay attention. So innovation uh, is, a, uh, is, is drawn from a Latin word, um, novus, okay? So um, anybody know what the, uh, the word novus means in Latin? Feel free to use chat. Okay, I'm seeing some- Would uh, that be new? Yeah, very good. Thank you. I, don't, I, I apologize. I didn't see who said that, but who? What, the, the voice of... Uh, oh, Gabe. Oh, hey, Gabe. I thought that was you. So Gabe is absolutely right. Innovation, the root word of innovation is new, uh, otherwise known as novus, uh, back in the day of, of the, uh, uh, the Greeks and Romans. So um, what I want to argue here today with innovation is that I truly believe it's on a sliding scale. Right, so you've got uh, a scale of impactfulness, and my definition, as as we just talked about, is something new and better that humans value. Okay, so let's let's unpack that. So innovation, uh, for it to be innovative, um, what we're looking for is some creativity, uh, or the other word that is is root here that you might recognize is novelty, novelty. So if, if something is new. Um, it could be novel, meaning it's never been done this way before. And a lot of times, uh, especially student innovators get tripped up on this because, you know, um, they'll come up with what they think is a new idea, a new way of doing something only to Google it and find out that, oh, it's already been done or it's already out there. Or somebody else is already doing that. And, you know, I think you don't need to be discouraged by that. I think that's actually a good thing in many cases that uh, finding that somebody else has come up with uh, the same um, relative uh, novel solution that you may have dreamed up 
uh, in, in, in your basement or in the shower or wherever it might be, illustrates that there is in fact a need uh, that needs to be met uh, through some uh, new way of doing something. So then your goal as an innovator, if, it, if it's not 100% novel and the icon that you see on the slide here is that is that of a patent. So if it is completely unique, nobody's ever thought of it before, you do have an opportunity to protect your idea, your intellectual property uh, by issuing uh, or having a patent issued to you as the inventor. So uh, in order for something to be innovative, it does have to have some uh, uh, novelty to it. So if it's not the technical product or the service or the, uh, the secret recipe or whatever it is, what I would challenge all of you is to think about the user experience. Think about the branding. You know, what about the currently patented product or the currently available solution isn't exactly what you want or what your friends and family and neighbors want. So you can actually improve upon the existing protected intellectual property. So don't be discouraged when you find that your bright idea is already out there, it's already been patented. Your job now as the innovator is just to make it better, right? Create a better brand, create a better user experience, create uh, something that attaches to the existing technology that just makes it more um, exciting, something that makes it more fresh or uh, magical or elegant. All of these adjectives apply. And so as we move down this sliding scale, uh, our, our goal as an innovator, regardless of novelty or newness of the idea, is to uh, practice continuous improvement, right? So the context in which your solution uh, exists is always going to change, right? So the, the solution or the product or the service needs to keep up. So how do we continue to evolve our concepts so that they fit in perfectly with the, the world around us. And that's you know this idea of continuous improvement, of iteration, of listening to the people who are trying to help and let their uh, input, their customer feedback influence how you make something that's better. And then finally, you know the holy grail of the definition of innovation is love, right? So the goal of, for all of us as creative thinkers, as people that want to make the world a better place, the goal is not to create something that's good. The goal is to create something that is mind-blowingly amazing. We want to create something that we ourselves would love to use and love to interact with and love to, to tell people about. And that's the difference, in my opinion, between you know, uh, you know, a venture or, an, or a product or a service that you know makes an impact, uh, you know, for a few people, or you know, gets a little bit of success, versus those that are are breakout successes that really change the world fundamentally. And so there's a whole uh, series of writings about the delta between uh, like and love, and that's why I use the icon, the the old good old Mike Mark Mark Zuckerberg's uh, like icon in the better category of this sliding scale. We got to go from like to love. And the only way to, to get to the love uh, checkbox is to create 100% value for the people that you're trying to help, meaning they are more than willing to deviate away from what they do on a daily basis and the products and services that they currently use to gravitate toward your solution. Your solution is so much more elegant, so much more magical, so much more in step with what they are, are seeking and desiring that they are, they love what you've built. And the, and the only way you're going to get to this end of the spectrum from bright idea on one end, the, the, the idea or the, the novelty on one end of the scale to the love is by being empathetic, by being deeply engaged with the people that you're trying to help. And so you might ask yourself, you know, why is uh, ASU number one in innovation, right? Why, why do we have this on the side of buses and billboards and if you look at the definition that I provided here, I can, I can kind of fill this in like a Mad Libs for you. ASU is a, a new American university. It's new, it's a new model. And it's better than the status quo models that are, are selective and, and closed and, and uh, you know, um, myopic in, in terms of their ability to bring people in and, and, and try new things. And, and finally, 
we're, be we're, we're better uh, and we're valuable because we've got uh, over 100,000 human beings that have deviated away from other opportunities to be a part of this uh, organization. So again, ASU is a new American university that's better than the traditional uh, forms of, of higher education. And it's valuable because we've got over 100,000 human beings that have joined our ranks and are uh, hopefully getting excited about the opportunity to create change in this environment. So again, uh, this is a level set because it's gonna feed into uh, hopefully what you're working on. You might be somewhere on this spectrum of new, better and valuable. So maybe think about where you might be. Hopefully all of you are, are thinking about a problem statement that um, might feed into this, this definition, this spectrum. How do I not only get a patent, but how do I actually deliver that technology to the people that need it? And then once it's delivered, how do I make sure that those people tell more people about it and I can create more impact on a larger segment of the population? And the only way that's going to happen uh, naturally without a ton of investor capital is if you create that love effect, that, that magical experience. And so let me give you a couple of examples of this. So, so some of you might be you know, working on problem statements that are in the, the, the social domain. This is one of my colleagues in the middle, the, the guy with the red hair. This is J Dr. Jared Shep. He teaches within our engineering projects and community service program. And he and his teammates were students back uh, when I first kind of got into this, into this realm of innovation at ASU. And uh, they were working on a problem statement related to um, folks in uh, uh, at-risk communities in um, developing countries such as Africa transporting water from the river, the dirty river to the, to the uh, dwelling uh, that could be miles away from the water source. So the problem statement was uh, uh, both, it was twofold. It was transporting and cleaning water in a more effective way for villagers in developing countries. So uh, for those of you that are working on big kind of uh, Maslow's base uh, of, the, of the hierarchy of human needs, uh, this is a good example of we might be able to solve this in an innovative way using a nonprofit business model. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, for those of you that are working in the realm of tech and with, with um, individual consumers or companies or um, other organizations, this is a great example that I had in my class a few years ago of uh, a problem statement that a group of students were tackling in the funeral home business. And they were acutely aware that there was a lot of inefficiency for those people that were running fu funeral homes. And so the problem statement was, how do we make um, you know, this one aspect of running a funeral parlor more efficient and, and better for us that have to deal with these nuances on a daily basis? So this is what I would describe as not so much as a, a social impact problem statement, but a, a pretty common business or enterprise level problem statement. And for some, you know, those of you in the audience, you might be looking at uh, you know, consumer level problem statements like uh, you know, getting access to high quality art or artists or um, you know, getting food delivered uh, uh, faster or quicker or more efficiently. So the list goes on and on. These are just two examples of problem statements that can kind of get us going down this road of how do we create a novel solution that's better than the existing uh, you know, opportunities that are available in the market and then the holy grail is, how do we create love? How do we create the product you know, to such a degree that people like Jessica in this example are actively seeking out the solution? Uh, so again, welcome to ASU. This is innovation country. We're number one, six years in a row. And it's not because of our entrepreneurs. It's not because of our technologists per se. It's because the, the business model that we're gonna talk about of Arizona State University has fundamentally changed dating back over the last uh, two decades, almost. So um, let's look at uh, business models as a means of creating and sustaining value. So in order uh, to um, move forward with this, your, your job, if you haven't already, is to identify a solution that humans value. And there's a key component, uh, well, two key components in this sentence. Uh, the first one is, well, we've already kind of talked about uh, novelty and solutions uh, that, are, that are targeted at, at specific problem statements. 
But the key here is that we're talking about individual humans and what they're willing to uh, you know, learn about, pay for, and then ultimately recommend. So human value is a key component of my definition of innovation. Something new and better that humans val value. So a solution by the, in this definition, it can be a product or a service. You know, it can even be broader than this, quite frankly. If you're developing a, a, a nonprofit solution, it might be an intervention, a way of doing something differently. It might be a government policy. It could be, um, you know, art, right? That might not fit nicely into product or service. Or it could be a combination of the two things, like in the realm of internet, internet of things, or in the realm of sensors, or in the well, realm of software as a service. Bottom line is, as we're having this discussion, I'd like to kind of unpack solution as being either a physical thing or a service-based thing. Bottom line is, regardless of how we define it, human beings are at the center of this equation. So what is value? So if we're uh, totally up to speed with, um, you know, now, okay, we get that, you know, innovation has to be new, maybe technology is involved, but at the end of the day, you know, if nobody's willing to use it, does it have value? And that's the question you have to ask yourself. If you come up with a new invention or a new product or a new brand or a new way of doing things, the ultimate question that you need to answer as an innovator is, which, which humans will use, pay for, and or recommend what I've come up with? Okay, so let's focus in on that. There's a couple different scenarios that could play out. You might have a specific actor in your problem domain that will be expected to use your, your solution, right? Your product, your service, your invention. But then there might be somebody else in the, in the equation that is different from that person that is expected to pay for it. And so the classic example here is Google. Right, so we all, most of us, I shouldn't say all, uh, some of you are using an, a, a new uh, search engine. I think it's called DuckDuckGo. Uh, a lot of people are abandoning Google for DuckDuckGo for privacy reasons, but bottom line is, if you ever use Google, did you pay for it? And the short answer is yes, you paid for it, but you paid for it with your, your eyeballs and your, your, your likeness and your privacy, perhaps. <laughs> Who paid for Google? Right, so uh, that that person is different. An ad, an advertising executive at a company that wants to promote uh, their products or service. So, uh, in the case of Google, the user is uh, maybe us, and then the payer is a company that wants to advertise to us. Uh, so that's the classic example of, of bifurcating uh, the human beings who are wrapped up in creation of value. So it might not just be a singular person, like the example I provided of uh, Jessica, the funeral home director, she uses whatever your solution might be, but she also pays for it. Uh, but going to a more social impact scenario like uh, delivering water technology, the villagers in Africa might not be expected to pay for the tech. But bottom line is every single one of you in your careers, in your role as an innovator, in your role as an, as an entrepreneur, regardless of your, your solution, your product or your service, across the board, you have to create value. So one of the key takeaways for today's session is, regardless of whether you're thinking about doing uh, an in, uh, in inter-organization, new product, new service, or a uh, commercial, like a, a, a consumer or enterprise product or service, or if you're thinking about doing a nonprofit, product or service, in every single scenario, you must create value. And the definition of value is right here, something that humans will use, pay for, and or recommend. Sound good? All right, let's unpack this a little bit. So in order to sustain, you know, so what we talked about right at the beginning of today's session, if you can deliver value, that's great. But here at ASU, the bar is higher. We want you to deliver value uh, to the world, right? We don't want you to deliver value if, 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 you, if you're able to, not just to your friends and family, not just to your local community, not to just to your city and your state, not even just to the U.S. We as college educated folks here at the, at the number one school of innovation in the entire United States, our goal is to take something that you built that has value 
and bring it to the entire world. Because the amount of effort that you're going to uh, sink into delivering it locally is about the same that you're going to probably sink in over the course of you know one year, five years, ten years to bring it to the world. So this is the word scale on this slide. So our mission for you is to invent something amazing and then bring it to the world because we, I'll, I'll be darned, you know that that's what we're able to do. Uh, having gone through these, hopefully these, uh, these practice runs at the university and learning about these methodologies. So how do we do it? We've got to figure out how to sustain it. And so if you create something, that's what we're going to introduce this, this powerful concept of a business model. So in order to sustain your, uh, your value, uh, you've got to uh, show that people are willing to use, pay for, or recommend your invention, your innovation, okay? So uh, let's start with nonprofit. Take a look at the top of this slide. So for those of you thinking about um, building a nonprofit business model, you still have a business model. A nonprofit means you don't exchange uh, currency between your users, your payers, and your supporters. It means you actually have to be more strategic about how you do that. In order for you to deliver your value, there has to be value coming back into your organization to scale and sustain your operation. So for those of you that are, are let's, let's look at an example. So for those of you that are uh, imagining a, a, a solution, an innovation, uh, like Jared and his teammates did to deliver water, um, you have to know personally who's gonna use your technology. And so I don't know this woman's name, here on, this, on the screen, but this is the status quo. This woman is looking for a way to transport water from the river back to her vi village that's, that she loves. Right now, she does not love her current solution. She's looking for a solution that she loves. And Jared, uh, Dr. Shep and his team believe they have developed a lovable solution. It's called Safe Sip, that barrel. Uh, it, it, it simultaneously transports and cleans the water. But the question is, is this uh, villager going to pay for this new technology? And the answer is no. So if you are, are considering delivering value the way Google does to us, you have to identify using actual names and email addresses and titles of who's going to pay for this solution. So uh, do you recognize those those people up on the other side of the screen, who's gonna pay for this technology to be delivered to the villager? Well, the answer is somebody who cares, right? Somebody who cares about making the world a better place and is, is looking, scouring uh, you know, the universities and scouring communities to find the right solution to, to solve this problem on a global scale. And I don't know if this is true or not, but it could be the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That's Bill and Melinda Gates in the photo. So Bill and Melinda Gates are the actual human beings who might value this new technology enough to, to pay for and recommend that it be instituted within this community. Does that make sense? So the bottom line for all of you is if you're doing a nonprofit or a uh, multi-sided business model with users who don't pay, you need to identify who is ultimately gonna pay for the technology to be developed, delivered, sustained, and scaled. So uh, the easier example is for those of you that might be maybe in the robotics space or in the tech space or in the consumer product space, uh, a for-profit enterprise is the other kind of basic model. Of course, there's many other business models to talk about, but the two main ones that we get questions about are nonprofits and for-profits. And so for those of you that are thinking about doing a for-profit, uh, you, you also need to know exactly who is the person that's going to use, pay for, and recommend your novel solution. So going back to Jessica, the funeral home director, uh, you know, the, 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 the founding team, I don't know if they ever developed their technology, but it's clear that they were onto something because if you Google uh, funeral home, uh, you know, uh, software, uh, there's plenty of opportunities for Jessica to streamline all the paperwork on her desk. So in this for-profit model, the, the key for all of you is knowing who Jessica is. What is Jessica's situational context and how might this product be uh, uh, new, 
than new a new opportunity for her to get her work done better than you know filling out paperwork and 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 sending invoices and bills the old school way and then ultimately your solution is so elegant and so powerful that Jessica is going to go to the next funeral directors association meeting and tell all of her our, her colleagues that run funeral homes all over the country oh my gosh you have to check out uh, this new product because it is just saved me 10 hours every single week uh, because it's so magical it's so uh, valuable to me. I love it. That's what you want to hear Jessica say. I love it. So um, hopefully this helps give you a little crash course in the realm of creating value, understanding how value is a component of innovation. And ultimately, a business model isn't a scary thing. Whether you want to do a nonprofit or for profit, you've got to understand how your value is going to, you know, get value in return from people that can help you scale and sustain your impact. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a program called Venture Devils. We invite all of you who want to uh, iterate through some of these uh, ideas with your own uh, venture concept or even a concept that you'd like to try out inside your employer's organization. Uh, venture Devils welcomes entrepreneurs, folks that are doing nonprofits, more than profits, for profits, uh, low tech, high tech, everything in between. Uh, so I invite you all to check out the website. You can apply. Um, we, we offer on ramps into this program five times a year. Uh, the next one is coming up literally within the next five to seven weeks. I know that uh, for a fact, uh, depending on when you're watching this video or, or, or tuning in right now. Uh, and you're going to be amongst friends. We have now over 500 startups that are practicing this value creation methodology uh, who are affiliated with the university. So again, don't fool yourself into thinking because of my invention, because of my talent, because of my creativity, I don't need to worry about creating value. You absolutely have to create value, whether you're doing a food truck or whether you're doing a high tech FinTech startup or robotic startup that's gonna take over the world. Creating a magical value proposition for the people that you're trying to help uh, is absolutely key. So uh, thanks so much for your time, really appreciate it. Um, and let's go change the world.